Hey, welcome to Element. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that uh, you guys are nice and comfortable at home. Please go ahead and stand with us, and uh, we'll sing some songs. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Cause you never change, no. You never fail, oh God. True are your promises. True are your promises. Cause you never change, you never fail, oh God. And so we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. Wide is your love and grace. Wide is your love and grace. Because you never change the you never fail, oh God. And so we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One who was and is and is to come. And so we raise up holy hands to praise the Holy One. We have a vision statement. It is part of who we are and hopefully it is burrowed so deep into you that you can explain who Element is if anybody asks. We are a church who exists to glorify God and we do that by teaching and living out the scriptures in our everyday lives. Then we take what is normal community and try and change that into what is gospel-centered community. And then we have this line at the end that says, and planting churches. Now that's not just a tagline, it's not just something that we think should be there, it's part of our DNA. It is part of who we are. We planted a church in Colorado Springs and now we'd like to introduce you to our latest church plant in Thailand. This plant is not called Element Thailand, as that would make no sense to the people there. It also won't look like a church plant in the United States, as the culture of Thailand is completely different. It is an endeavor that has been in the works for quite some time. Element has worked with the ministry called Bridges to the Nations for a few years now. They were actually the ones who helped us get in touch with the Tamar Center, who works with getting young women out of prostitution in the red light districts of Thailand. One of the many ways to also combat the rampant exploitation of the young and vulnerable in that country is to go to the source, the northern villages. 
This is actually an answer to prayer, that God would lead us and guide us to a church planter that we could partner with, with the ultimate goal that you could go and help when needed, not just to be a tourist, but actually to be brothers and sisters in Christ to help those in need in a foreign land. Now, as of this video, Tom and Jing have been going out every day to villages and praying for people who are sick or have needs. They are sharing the gospel in a way that connects to the local people and have already led several to Christ. They are leading a church in their home that doubles as a children's ministry center as well. Additionally, the nearest official church with the building had deteriorated in numbers to a small handful. They recently asked Tom to come and preach every other week for them, and they are seeing people come back to church again. Tom and Jing are helping an existing church and starting a home church. Thailand is moving towards a new openness to the gospel, and Tom recently baptized five people, which is awesome, but it's also not normal for Thailand. But we pray that it becomes the new normal. Now we are hoping and praying like you that in 2021, COVID goes away. And when that happens, we want to take a small film crew there so you can see what's actually going on. And then after that, when we see the need, many of you could actually go and visit and be a part of that. Currently, Element is paying Tom and Jing's salary, their rent, and their ministry expenses, and they will be part of our 2021 budget. And I just want to say thank you, Element, for your generosity and faithfulness. It's because of that that we can actually do things like this. So we would ask that you would continue to keep Element Thailand or whatever you want to call it in your prayers because God knows what you mean. Hello, my name is Tom. Hi, my name is Jane. I'm very excited to share about what we're doing here. We just moved to here in Bungan for four months to start our ministry. Our vision is we want to see the harvest in the northeast of Thailand and see the revival. We also want to see the believer rise up to earnest and serve the Lord. We also want to share the love of God to the children and teach them about God. So here are what we're doing now. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we go to visit people at their home and share gospel and visit sick people to pray for them, ask God for the healing and visit the new believer to teach them Bible. And on Thursday, we have home church here, also at another believer's home too. On Friday after school and Saturday, we have children program here. On Sunday, we join with a church close to our village. The church invite Tom to be one of a pastor preaching every other week and teach Bible in the morning. So the last, we want to say thank you, thank you very much for your support. You are donate help a lot of people hear the good news of God. Thank you so much. God bless. So as you can see, Element is still going with our vision statement, not only by teaching and living out the scriptures, turning community into gospel community, which is hard doing COVID, but we're trying, but also planting churches. We're very excited about that. I'd also like to say welcome from wherever you are. I'm not going to say all the places this time because what we're finding out is a lot of people are watching these live stream services on demand, which is cool, which you can actually pause the live stream. You can watch it anytime you want. So whenever you're watching, welcome to you. Today is going to be a little bit different. In the middle of the message, we're going to try something new. Uh, we had a meeting to talk about some things that might help with some parents during COVID because some kids, you can only get like 15 minutes into a message. So at about 15 minutes in, I'm going to stop. I'm going to ask a couple questions. At that point, if you like to journal, you could pull out a journal and write down the questions, pause the live stream, answer those. If you're not into that, we'll just keep going. You can follow along, but it's a way to give you a little bit of a break if you have kids to pause and take care of them and do what you need to do and then come back and you won't really miss anything. So we'll see how that works. If you have a smart device, you can download 
download an app. It is called Uversion. Click on More and then Events in Uversion. If you live in our area, uh, the Orchid Santa Maria area, we will come up by GPS in your smartphone, and you will get sermon notes, verses, and questions, and all that goes with the message. If you're not in our area, you type in the zip code 93455, and you will get all those things as well. My name is Aaron. I am one of the pastors here. If you would like to stand with me for the reading of God's Word, well, we'd like for you to be able to do that, uh, but this is the reading of God's Word. This is Acts 24, verse 5, and it says, For we have found this man a plague, when who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout all the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. And they are talking there about the Apostle Paul. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we ask that you would take us as a people and help us to understand the situations and the places that we are in and the ways that we can still lift you up as our great God and Savior. That we would cheerfully be able to do that because we understand your great rescue of us exactly where we are, that the places we are have been we have been placed there by you, and we would trust you wherever you send us and wherever you place us. Amen. Amen. So this is Acts, the, the second part, uh, part two, where we follow the life and ministry, essentially, of the Apostle Paul. It's week 31. And at the beginning, I usually give you a little recap about where we've been in case you got lost last week or this is your first time or maybe you missed a few weeks. But today I want to start and remind you that where Paul is is where a lot of us are today, kind of in a moment of crisis that becomes a little bit overwhelming. And God is once again going to be able to reveal himself and his faithfulness. Paul's circumstances have not always been easy, just like ours today. But God walks through and sees him through every single part of that. God has done that in Thessalonica. He's done it in Corinth and Ephesus. He's done it in Jerusalem. And now Paul will, or God will walk with Paul through the trials that he is in. Each piece of Paul's imprisonment, each place where he has been before that, God has walked with him. And I don't know if maybe when you have followed Jesus in your life, there's sometimes a moment of clarity that comes about that you are exactly where you need to be. And for Paul, that takes place in jail, arrested, and on trial. And countless Christians throughout the ages have had times and places where they're experiencing God, like opening up the clouds and saying, you are where you are supposed to be. Some people have said that as we go through the book of Acts, how well it resonates with them where they are. And they realize that though they are kind of overwhelmed, they are where they need to be. I have had these times in my life where God kind of shows me that I'm where I'm supposed to be. It's happened at Costco one time. It's happened on a, on a ski slope. It's happened at a hospital when I was visiting someone. It's happened at a wedding I wasn't even doing. And I think too often we as Christians sell ourselves short. We don't think that our lives are that meaningful. And yet they are because God cares about us. And God places us where we need to to be. And it's good to remember that. St. Paul is a guy who was never promised an easy time from God, but God did promise Paul that he would make it to Rome in order to be God's witness there. And so Paul is now just moving forward knowing he's going to get there. And remember though, when we talk about that word witness, when God tells Paul, you're going to be my witness, that's where we get our word martyr from. And eventually Paul will die for his faith in Jesus, though that does not happen in the book of Acts. So where we are in Acts is that that some religious people, they took a vow that they would neither eat nor drink till the apostle Paul died, and they fully expected that to be by their own hands. They hatch a plot. Now, that plot that is hatched is found out by the Roman tribune, a guy named Claudius. And so Claudius takes Paul, who was under his care, and then sends Paul to Caesarea to a governor named Felix. I personally think Paul, uh, Claudius is looking for a way out of this mess because he doesn't really know what he can do with the apostle. Paul. He wants to beat him to get the truth out of him, even though Paul has been honest, but he's not allowed to beat him because Paul's a Roman citizen. But he doesn't know what's going on with all the Jews who hate him because he can't figure out all the religious minutia that is taking place. And I don't know if you care about history stuff, but Paul has to go to Felix. It's the only place he can go because Paul is from an area called Cilicia, which like Judea comes under the Roman administration at the time in Syria. 
If Paul came from a different province anywhere else, Claudius would have then sent Paul somewhere else to be tried by that local governor. Like when Jesus was on trial, Pontius Pilate takes Jesus and says, I don't want to deal with this, and sends him to Herod. Herod's like, I'm not touching that, sends him back to Pontius Pilate. Well, Felix can't send Paul anywhere else. He has got to deal with it. But eventually, in the end, you'll see next week is he just starts to try and ignore it all. Now, historically, we know a few things about Felix and his wife. His wife's name is Drusilla. She is Jewish, and we'll talk about her next week a bit. But Felix is this really interesting story in the Roman Empire because he started off at the bottom and went near to the top. He's actually born a slave, but after getting his freedom, him and his brother Paulus, they become the favorites of the emperor Claudius. Now, Claudius liked to do with this with a lot of people. He would take people who were born very low and raise them into high positions. It made the elite and the aristocrats very angry, but it kept people very loyal to him, and it made sure that not a whole lot of rebellion would take place. And so Felix is a guy who was looked down upon by the Roman elite. Kind of like maybe a janitor at Harvard has a son who goes to Harvard, becomes valedictorian, and one day runs the school. You know, a lot of people be like, hey, that's a cool story. But some of the elites would be like, oh, you know, I don't really like that. His term of office in Judea ran from about 52 to 59 AD. So we know when Paul was actually there. Now, Felix, while he ruled this area, the Jews are given more and more and more reasons to hate the Romans. They say a lot of the things that Felix did led eventually to the revolt in AD 66 of the Jewish people. Now, while Paul's in prison, especially in this place with Felix, he's not just sitting there doing jigsaw puzzles and wondering about life. He actually starts writing letters. We have letters in the New Testament that are called the prison epistles. And they're letters that Paul writes when he's there. And what he writes is about the encouragement of what God is doing no matter where you find yourself because God is faithful. And so many times we struggle with those questions of what God is doing in the midst of our turbulent places like COVID. And Paul says all the questions that we have are summed up in God's faithfulness because Jesus came to rescue us. Paul says God's glory in the person of Jesus is shown because God is faithful to his promises and God will always go on being faithful to his promises, even if he has a surprising way of showing that at times. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 24. That's where we are. Uh, Paul is on trial in front of Felix. The high priest, Ananias, is coming from Jerusalem. Uh, Ananias is the guy who had Paul punched in the face a couple weeks ago. That's him. And this is what happens. Acts 24, verse 1. And after five days, the high priest, Ananias, came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. So Tertullus is a guy who comes along with the high priest. He is actually a hired lawyer. He's a hired gun. They spent their money to get someone to make sure they could get rid of Paul. Uh, N.T. Wright says this, Jokes about lawyers are always unkind, ungrateful, uncharitable, and often uncannily accurate. Like, here's, here's a joke. Uh, an attorney is working late one night, and the devil shows up to him, and he says, I'm going to offer you something. I'm going to make it so you win every case you ever try. I'm going to make it so all your, your clients and colleagues, they worship you. Everyone stands in awe of you. You're going to make enormous amounts of money. But in return, I am going to require your soul and your wife's soul and your parents' souls and your grandparents' soul and your kids' soul and your friend's soul. And the attorney looks at him, and he goes, Okay, but what's the catch? Lawyer jokes, right? Like, I have a friend who's a lawyer, and I know they're not all like that, but there's a sentiment about that. I have been in a court deposition once, and a lawyer took me to pieces about something I was totally sure about. Like, it happened four years before it. I'd put it out of my mind. But when I was 16 years old, I worked at a swap meet. I had a boss who was a pretty cool guy, and at one point, some lady actually started driving through where people were walking and the vendors were selling, and my boss runs up next to her car and starts knocking on her window going, hey, you can't drive this way. She rolls down her window, grabs a hold of his arm, and takes off and starts dragging him, and eventually she rips the watch off his arm and drives off. So we call the police, we make a police report, thought it was over, and then a few months later, he gets sued for assaulting her. It's like, what? And so four years later, I get called in, and they ask me all kinds of questions about it. I mean, 
I, I couldn't remember the color of the car or things like that, so like I obviously don't know what I'm talking about. But they tied me in a pretzel. I didn't know what was really going on in this. They had scraps and ideas and bits and pieces. And in the end, my boss said it was going to cost them more money to fight it than to just settle. And so they settled. That's what lawyers get paid for, to make sure everything that you want said on your side gets said. Here's a question. Why do they bury lawyers under 20 feet of dirt? Because deep down, they're really good people. <laughs> Part of the problem in the ancient world is just like ours. People who had a lot of money could afford the best attorneys, and these effective lawyers would present any information you wanted to get things to go your way, where judges and juries would go along with what you want because you paid for it. So here's the case, verse 2 of chapter 24. And when he, that's Paul, had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. In every way and everywhere, we accept this with all gratitude. But to detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world, and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you'll be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined joined in the charge affirming that these things were so. So Tertullus finally comes to the charge that is against Paul. He is a ringleader. He's causing riots. He's doing all of these things. He's defiling the temple or at least attempting to. And this is what lawyers do. They put all these arguments out there to try and get people to believe what they are saying. And lawyers will use flattery if they think it will help. Uh, Felix is probably somebody who likes the flattery as well. And it's funny because most historians read these words and they totally disagree with Tertullius' open lines. Through you we enjoy much peace. Like Judea was technically at peace, but it was forced at the end of a sword. And there's all this discontent that comes about just below the surface, ready to burst out at any excuse. And this is why a lot of historians think that the riot took place so easily, because everybody was so angry about all the stuff that was going on, and they saw Paul, and they said, get that guy, and they had an outlet. Historically, Felix was not a man of foresight. He never made any reforms or improvements in Israel. Tertullian says he's just not telling the truth. And most likely, he and all of his friends and the high priest probably laugh at Felix behind his back. But Felix is a guy who is loyal to Rome and won't do anything to displease Rome. Paul is seen as a troublemaker. He's rocking the boat of those people who have power sewed up for themselves. It's why the lawyer will say, examine him yourself. When he says examine him, it doesn't mean ask him questions. What it means is take him and torture him until he says what we want him to say. That's what examine him means there. People who have power will do anything to keep their power and their privilege. And problems will come in friendships and workplaces and politics and churches when someone decides to tell the truth and ask some very hard questions. What we want people around us to do is just say, no, everything's fine. Don't make a fuss. Keep going this direction that you want to go. Like, I've had some very hard questions right now with people around what outreach looks like during COVID or white privilege or racism, and it's hard to ask the really hard questions. But one commentator says it like this, the Christian gospel is designed to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. And Paul did that. Paul would comfort those who were disturbed, but he would disturb those who were comfortable. So what does Paul say? Well, Acts 24, verse 10. And when the governor had nodded to him to speak, Paul replied, and Paul is going to reply as the only person who will speak honestly in this entire thing. Paul says this, knowing that for many years you have been judge over this nation. That is true. There is no flattery. I cheerfully make my defense. This is also a little bit funny because uh, Felix's name means happy. So it's kind of a play on his name. I cheerfully make my defense to you, Mr. Happy. Uh, you can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogue or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept." 
that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. Paul starts into this and he repeats the gospel and the good news and he says, and this is something that if they would be honest enough about, they would say they would agree with it. Verse 17, now after several years I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. Again, all true. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult, but some Jews from Asia, and now Paul references Roman law, he says, they ought to be here before you and make an accusation should they have anything against me. That's the Roman law. You get to face your accusers. And Paul says, they should be here. They aren't even here. These guys weren't there. The ones that are accusing me, the ones who did see it, should say something if it was actually true. Verse 20, he says, or else let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council. Other than this one thing that I cried out while standing among them is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. So what Tertullus does is he says, Paul's a ringleader, a central figure in this sect, the Nazarenes. We would call them Christians. Paul calls it the way. At this point, there is not a standard thing that Christians called themselves because Christians just assume that they were Jews because they were the fulfillment of everything Judaism taught. So that's who they, what they thought they were. So Paul doesn't deny it. He just says they completely misunderstand it. And Felix is a little bit smarter than they kind of give him credit for, because you read this in verse 22. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, that's the sect of the Nazarenes. Why would he have that? Because his wife was Jewish. Put them off saying, when Lysias the Tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he, that's Paul, should be kept in custody, but have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So Felix kind of does his homework a little bit before the case takes place. He knows a little bit what Christianity is, a little bit about what is going on. And he will even go to speak to Paul, which you will see uh, next week. And the charges against Paul were classy crimes, that if Paul was guilty of them, they would have put him to death because anything that threatened the Roman government or Caesar was to be gotten rid of. But Felix shows a little bit of restraint, I think a bit of grace, but I think he also does this not killing Paul at this moment because he wants to stick it to those elites who are around him. So what I would like to do right now, if your kids are going crazy and you want to take care of them, you can kind of pause the live stream right here if you'd like or journal. But I've got a couple questions to ask you in this. First off, have you ever been wrongly accused of anything? or unjustly accused about something. Like maybe how Paul is, I mean, maybe not to that extent, but have you ever felt like that? And then you have to look at Paul and say, well, how can Paul respond the way that he does? Well, Paul responds the way that he does because he understands that Jesus took our sin upon himself. All the things that we were rightly condemned for in front of God, all of our sins, Jesus took upon himself. And Paul realizes that. And so when he speaks to these people, he does it also with a bit of grace. And so my question really for you is, when there are times when you are unjustly accused of something by your spouse, boss, coworker, neighbor, something like that, if you could think in those moments of how Christ came and died for you and took your sin upon himself for the things that you rightly should have been condemned for but are not, would that change how you respond in those areas? All right, so now we're going to keep going. You may wonder how I could even say that I thought Paul was completely honest when he said, I cheerfully make my defense, you know, before for Felix. Like, how could he say that when he knows he's on trial for something he didn't really do? Well, it's not because he thinks that the Roman system is flawless or will do everything right. Paul has been around the Roman system for a very long time. He knew Roman law and how bad it can be. He's not naive thinking that Caesar is turning a corner because Caesar still expects everybody in the empire to worship him and not Jesus alone. But Paul will cheerfully make his defense in front of Mr. Happy for the same reason that I have been telling you all along towards the end of the series in the last few weeks, that he knows where he is supposed to be because Jesus has placed him there. He trusts who God is and what God has done in him where he is now. He trusts that God is the creator who will bring all things together and call the whole creation into account, 
even if it's not even in his own lifetime. He knows that human governments will sometimes get it right, but mostly they will get it wrong. And it remains the task of God's people to be those who step out and cheerfully make a defense of what the gospel is to the world around us. We remind everyone who God is and what Jesus has done. And in the midst of that, sometimes we even get to remind governmental authorities what their true job actually is. And this is why when Paul speaks about things, he always goes back to the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus is not only at the heart of the Christian faith, it drives our understanding of how and why we're supposed to live and what government is actually there for. As you go through the book of Acts, as each trial progresses, Luke makes this clearer and clearer and clearer that in the story of the early church, God is bringing all things to the ultimate culmination of what he intends as the church begins to speak of the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's the announcement of that good news. And the result of the gospel is that God is putting the world right again. And it starts in Jesus. The reality of what God brings to the gospel is seen in what he is going to do, not just at the end of time, but every single day as God changes lives and restores us and helps us to see what he is actually doing. When we see again those changed lives and those spoken promises, those are meant to be signs of what is to come and what is happening now. Luke wants his readers to see that the life of the church is meant to be lived out in cheerful defense of what the gospel is. And for us, Element, that means that we should not expect a comfortable ride every time we go and do something. Too many people, what they want to do is say, well, I believe in Christianity, I believe in Jesus, and I'm going to keep that over here and let the world stay over here, and I'm not going to interact with that. I just want to stay comfortable. But that is never what we have been called to. We have been called to live out our faith in the world as we make our cheerful defense of what God is doing and has done, as God puts into the world the effects of the gospel through his people and how they live. And that means our anticipation is not just for the end, with some rapture or some cataclysm or something like that. It's for what God is doing today in our lives with other people. And we should expect the uncomfortable but necessary setting right that is going on all over the place in the world that takes place with God working through us. Sometimes a scene in history that can be martyrdom and sometimes it can be vindication and acquittal. But the church is meant to make its way in the world. And the sad thing is, as Paul speaks to the Jews, his people, he keeps trying to remind them of this. This is what they have always hoped for, but they refuse to acknowledge it. In verse 14, Paul says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Can you imagine if just for a moment they would stop fighting Paul and simply say, yeah, that's what we actually long for. Because I think it's what every person on this planet truly longs for. The hope of this has always been expressed throughout the Hebrew scriptures and the Psalms and the prophets. This grows directly out of ancient Judaism when Abraham is speaking to God in Genesis 18.25 and he says, you are the judge of all the earth. You are going to do what is right. Peter and Paul's ministries echo a lot of each other. And Peter says the same thing. In Acts 3, 18 to 21, Peter says this, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the hope that they had. This is the hope that we had that we will always have, that the creator God himself will one day sort everything out. He will restore all things. He will end injustice. He will overturn corruption and decay and death itself. And this is why Paul speaks about a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. That is not some weird doctrine tacked on a Judaism. That is the hope of God's final sorting out of everything. God's ultimate judgment for the whole world is done by God himself in a way that brings us 
cheerfulness that makes us a people who can live in joy as we speak about what God is doing. That was and is the great hope of Israel. It's the great hope of all of creation. In Psalm 96, verses 10 through 13, this is what it says. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. And what is the result of that? Let the heavens be glad and the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. In righteousness and faithfulness. That is the hope that we have. And this is why Paul can say what he says in his trial with truth and honesty. I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. I think a good question for us is, do we? Do we take those same pains because we know what Christ has done for us? I mean, Paul knows, and so do his accusers, that doesn't mean you never do anything wrong. It means that we become a people who seek to recognize, confess, and make amends for sin. I mean, Paul says this, and he is somebody who just, uh, you know, a few weeks or a few weeks before that, he, he got mad at the high priest who punched him in the face, and then he apologized for it. Paul says that he is a person who would never dream of deliberately doing anything that would either offend God or other people. And you might ask, well, how is that? Because Paul was always offending everybody. Well, not wanting to offend someone doesn't mean you won't ever offend someone. Like when Paul spoke of the resurrection, just by saying that, it offended some people. Maybe you've had that happen in your life. I had a philosophy instructor in college who, as soon as he found out I was a Christian, he was just like, well, I don't like you. Why? Because you're a Christian. And he went after me the entire class. I mean, I felt like I gave it back to him, so I wasn't as nice as Paul. But it, it, it was there. But this is why Paul tries to make this clear about how we're supposed to live with our cheerful defense. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, Paul says, Whatever you drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. This is the rule that Paul wanted to follow. And that's why the charges against him are completely ridiculous. And it's why Paul does what he does. I mean, Paul admits, yeah, there were some... Jews from Asia who said I did this thing but it's totally not true and if they had a thing against me they should come here and say that because by Roman rights I have the right to face my accusers and then he points out the only thing that anybody there might have taken offense of is that with the Sadducees when he said I believe in the resurrection of the dead Paul does this so he can point to why he is making the defense the way that he is the truth of the gospel that God's final hope has come to meet us all in the person of Jesus Christ. And that is a hope that is already realized and a hope that is yet to come both. And Paul will address this again and again and again. And we are people who get the groundwork of what that looks like. And Paul sees himself doing all these things as being on solid ground because God is sure, because Jesus is sure. Now, sometimes when I write these messages and we go through these things, I feel like you might get a bit weary because I keep saying the same things over and over and over again. I hope you don't feel that way, but a couple of you have actually said, said you do. But I want you to understand why Luke is doing this. He wants us to understand that this repetition is good for us so we actually remember it, that God brings his promises to fruition. He does. Like when Paul, as I said, writes these prison epistles when he's under arrest in these these few years, he will write one to this church called Philippi, and we call it the Book of Philippians, and it's all about joy. In Philippians 3.1, Paul will say this, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and and is safe for you. And if I ever take you to Philippians, which I plan to do one day, you might get tired of the word joy. You might think you can't, but I'm going to give it my best shot. But it's all meant to be a reminder where we say these things over and over that we see that God's promises are true because God is true and we can be a cheerful people who speak about what the gospel is no matter where we are. Paul, even in the end, tries to redirect them to what Christianity really is. They call it a sect. What's a sect? Well, that's a group of troublemakers and dangerous groups. Paul says it's not a sect. This is why we call it the way, which is how Jews for a very long time spoke about the Torah. The Torah was called the way, the way you live your life. All the people who are so zealous for the law, 
They were zealous for the way. So Paul uses their language to try to connect with them and say, I am still living the way, the truth, and the life that is found in Jesus. Because for Paul, following Jesus was never some hobby that pulled him away from the Jewish scriptures and tradition. It is the only way by which the one true God has fulfilled all the scriptures had said. Paul is claiming to not only be a loyal and faithful Jew, but a restored image bearer of God. That God is bringing all things back together again. And that was and will be his boast through all of his trials. That Jesus had never stopped made him being true to his ancestral faith, but that Jesus had revealed who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had always been. And he has come to rescue us in the person of Jesus. And Paul will talk about his former life and say, I was just like these people. I would persecute the Christians as well, but that's because I didn't have full and true knowledge. In Romans 10, 1 through 4, Paul, I quoted this to you a couple weeks ago, but Paul talks about this. He says, Brothers, my heart, desire, and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit themselves to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes the knowledge of God. And that's where Paul wanted everybody to go. And this must be our heart's desire as well. Because with where we are today in our country, it it is sliding very quickly into a whole lot of insane things. And the only way for us not to be an insane people is to take our stand on the solid place where Paul did, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that we can be a people who make a cheerful defense. And this is what the gospel will breed in us, no matter if we find ourselves on trial like Paul or living out our daily lives, no matter where we are in the midst of COVID, if we trust Jesus. See, the heart of the way that Paul speaks about is the gospel. This this cheerfulness that we have is a result of when we understand what the resurrection truly is and brings, the fruition of all of God's promises that he has ever made in the world. And so we trust him to restore us to himself. And that puts us in a place to be a people who can have joy no matter what situation we find ourselves in because we know God is true and good and right and holy and holds us in his hands. And this is another reason why every week I try and bring you guys to this place where we talk about communion and and what it is. And if you would like to, I'd encourage you to grab a piece of bread or a cracker, some wine, some grape juice and eat them together or dip one in the other. And remember that Christ's body was broken for us, that he was despised and rejected, that he took upon himself all the things that we were rightly accused of and that he never did. He was sinless and blameless. He takes that upon himself to rescue and save us. He removes the sin that stands between us and God and us and one another. And then he rises to life again to restore us to life. And this is what Paul continues to speak about, the joy that he has received in Christ's rescue and redemption of him. And that is what should bring us joy as well as we speak about the goodness of that. Now, I would encourage you, if you guys need prayer today, if you would like to, you can put them on the side of the, of the live stream. You can send a prayer request to connectourelement.org. If you'd like one of our elders to you know, talk and maybe pray with you, uh, maybe over Zoom call or even in person, we'd be, we'd be willing to do that. What we want to do is be able to connect with you in a way that helps you to understand that we can even find cheerfulness and joy in the midst of this pandemic. Because God is good, and no matter where we find ourselves, God is still faithful to us. So I'd encourage that. Uh, You know, when we meet together, there's offering boxes all throughout the room, and we invite you to give because God has been so faithful to us as a people, so we give as part of our worship. And you can still do that. Uh, You can give online. uh, You can mail things to us, and, and we continue to do things like plant churches around the world and help people who need help. But I would encourage you, you know, this week, maybe sit down with people and talk with them. Maybe give them your best lawyer joke, right? (laughs) But then start talking about maybe all the places if we understood really what the gospel is in our rescue, it would change us maybe from being such a, a dejected and sad and irritable people into a cheerful people who would cheerfully talk about, you know, the great things that God still does in the midst of what we are going through right now because he is good. He is good. And I would encourage all of you to come alongside somebody else this week and encourage them in God's faithfulness and his grace that has been given to every single one of us.
Let's pray. Father, this morning I ask that you would take us and move us to be a people who trust in your, in your grace and your kindness, that we would understand that we ourselves have been forgiven by you in your faithfulness towards us by sending Christ to die and rise from the grave for us. And that we would understand what that gospel message truly is so it changes us and our hearts and our lives and we be transformed into a people who worship and honor you as you truly are. That we would live out a life that has a cheerful defense when we speak about the gospel and your good news that would change us again from being this dejected people who are self-centered to people who see outside of ourselves and find great joy in who you are and your rescue of us. We thank you for being so good to restore us to yourself, to give us new life again, and that we would find and live out that new life even in the places we are today. We thank you for loving and saving us. Teach us again to live in that joy this week. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. The sinner now a saint For the God who died came back to life And everything has changed Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Oh death where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your bow? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from sweet embrace I see your scars your open arms the beauty of your face through tears of joy to lift my voice in everlasting praise hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave oh death where is your sting Oh, fear, where is your power? For the mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise His name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Is risen from the grave, and so 
You're the light. 
for your love, Lord, I pray that we would be a people, God, that share your love and share your, share your word, Lord, that we would be an a, a image bearer of you. Lord, that people would, would see you and, and, and learn to love you through the way that we act, through the way we behave, through we, the way we communicate. Lord, I pray that you bless us, Lord, with the, your wisdom and with the words to say, Lord, that we would be uh, good and faithful servants, Lord. We thank you so much for, again, your word and your love and the blessings you bestow upon our lives. Amen. All right, if you guys want to join us and standing for one more song while you guys are at home, it'll be great. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing his praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. The creation waking up to kingdom come. See the hope of heaven shining like the rising sun. And now and forever, lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love and no darkness in his endless light. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us. The everlasting world, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior. Sing his praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we look to the sun. Creation waking up to kingdom come. The hope of heaven shining like the rising sun And now and forever Lifted up from death to life There's no fear in love And no darkness in his endless light Beyond the skies above Love reaching out for Jesus our God, oh we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing his praises forever, oh we look to the sun. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior. Sing his praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Oh, we look to the sun. All right, thank you so much for coming and joining us this Sunday. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.
okay, okay. So I got a joke. I got this joke. Uh, there's a lawyer and there's a rabbi and a Hindu, and they're driving down the road in the car. Don't ask me why they're in the same car. I don't know. But their car runs out of gas in the middle of nowhere. And then so they get out of the car and they start walking and they say, oh, there's a farmhouse. So they go to the farmhouse and the farmer comes out and he goes, well, you know what? I, I can't take you to get gas tonight, but I can do it in the morning, but I only have two beds in the house. So one of you is going to have to sleep in the, in the barn. And so the rabbi goes, it's okay. I'm a servant. I'll go sleep in the barn. So about five minutes later, up on the front door, it's the rabbi. And he's like, you know, there's a pig in the barn. I can't sleep under the roof with the pig. It's an unclean animal. And so the Hindu goes, it's okay. I'll be a servant. I'll sleep in the barn. Next thing you know, five minutes later, and it's like, what? And the Hindu goes, there's a cow in the barn. Cows are sacred. I can't sleep with the cow in the barn. And so the farmer goes to the lawyer, you're going to have to sleep in the barn. Five minutes later, it's the cow and the pig. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He's a lawyer. <laughs>